The Mystery Flesh Pit. I know that sounds dirty. I promise it's not. It's a living cave believed to be the internal organs of a leviathan creature extending more than 19,000 feet into the earth. So gargantuan that a plethora of otherworldly creatures make up a complex eat or be eaten ecosystem inside of its bowels. The only thing more colossal are the memories that you and your loved ones will make on your vacation to the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, a Lovecraftian vista that's safe and fun for the whole family. Ugh, God damn it. The Mystery Flesh Pit National Park is a now defunct national park in Texas. We know about this park because of one artist, Trevor Roberts, aka Strange Vehicles on Reddit, who has an extensive collection of media and artifacts relating to the park. They've done a great job documenting it, and I'll be linking to their work in the description. The cave was first reported in a letter from an employee of an oil company to one Colton Fleming on May 2nd, 1973. To better understand the gravity of this discovery, I'm going to read a section from this letter. This thing that those old boys found is some kind of organic deposit that must go down at least five or six hundred feet by my reckoning. Not a fungus either. This thing breathes and makes sounds same as any other creature. And it bleeds. God, how it bleeds. Soon after its discovery, a deep earth mining pit by the name of Anodyne stepped in and began managing the flesh pit. Anodyne was responsible for creating and maintaining, and I use that second word very loosely, the infrastructure around and inside the mystery flesh pit. They got it sanctified as a national park, meaning it is preserved by the government but can still be used by companies independently. Since Anodyne maintained access to the resources, they had the genius idea of mining through the creature's internal organs and tissues used for the strange materials inside. Anodyne used these never-before-seen biological materials in a strange myriad of new products. For example, a computer that processes information using a neural tissue from the creature. The profits and expansion turned this mining company into a multi-industry conglomerate mega company. The local populace tried to capitalize on it as well, and the town identity shaped around the pit, like Roswell in UFO culture. But not everyone was in love with the pit. This thing was hard to sell at first. Okay, so we have a giant sarlacc pit in the middle of Texas, and we want people to willingly climb down its throat. But how do we market it? Hypnotize the children? Get out of my head. Enter Caver Coop. Caver Coop was a fictional character that starred in animated children's propaganda films to make people not afraid of the cave. This character became so popular that they created Caver Coop's spooky Halloween carnival, with fun children's activities such as haunted hayrides, scary petting zoo signed liability waiver required, and blood. In the belly of the beast lies an ecology that blurs the line between what is ecosystem and what is immune system. The majority, if not all, of the fauna is blind because before humanity lit the inside of this creature's body, it was in complete darkness. Meet the abyssal copepod, a crustacean-like creature that can grow up to 20 feet or 6 meters long. The copepod has a varied diet, including humans. Many accidents in the park involve these misunderstood beasts and over-eager tourists. They also got these weird little grass Abby fingers. If you look around a bit, you're certain to find macrobacteria sliding across the flesh scape. These massive 12 foot bacterial blobs are unlike anything else seen on the surface. Macrocosms of the single celled life we frequently encounter but never see. Equally as strange, the amorphous shame looks like a pile of loose organs with no rhyme or reason. It's actually theorized to be the ancient descendant of a weasel that crawled into the cave. All of its body parts became vestigial and shriveled away over time, and now it's just a pile of fleshy bits that squeezes throughout the folds of the organism, absorbing nutrients in a fashion similar to osmosis. A rare encounter. A lone gas owl stares blankly into the distance and sounds its mating call. <coughs> <laughs> These are just the tip of the iceberg, as there are many more elusive oddities such as the shrieking cloistropod, stinging triocanth, gastric bristleworm, and the Venus shamble. Keep an eye out for them. I mean, as long as you've signed your waivers, I don't really care, but you're probably gonna want to anyway. Now that you've signed your liability waivers, it's time to have some fun. But before we get going, here are some state-mandated safety tips that we've developed from good old-fashioned trial and error. Remember to stay a safe distance away from creatures in the pit. If it changes its behavior because of you, looks at you, raises its antennae, secretes scent enzymes, or begins making territorial clicks while trying to locate you, you are too close. 
close. Allow all organisms to continue unhindered and you may just be afforded the opportunity to safely observe these amazing creatures in their natural habitat. It's always important to be aware of your surroundings to avoid hazards. Remember, you're in the internal systems of a living organism, and this environment is actively hostile towards human life. This calcified multicolored formation is known as the Circus Clown Chymus, a beautiful yet dark reminder of why you should always stay on the trail. A group of performing clowns fell into the upper maw of the entry orifice, and a dilation of an epiglottal fold allowed them to slide into a then unreinforced area of the pit. Rescue personnel were able to locate them in a digestive sac, but they had already been heavily digested. Many of them were still alive, but they fused together as their giblets melted and now existed as one large, runny, writhing mass. An experimental antacid was applied to the gruey, screaming mound, but it was too late. The compound flash calcified the mass to the hauntingly stunning formation you see in front of you. While this is brutal, it's still not the worst case scenario of what can happen in the pit. I mean, could you imagine what could have happened if these performers didn't sign waivers? On rare occasions, creatures from the megafauna's body will venture out onto the surface and drag animals back down into the pit. In the uncommon instance that they aren't immediately consumed, they can undergo strange phenomena known as anatomical amalgamation that we are proud to say happens nowhere else on the planet. This process results in a compound organism, which is a hybrid of different surface animals. This process is not fully understood, but we do know that it often results in partial fusion of major body elements and sometimes the relocation of eternal organs to the outside of the body. Should you encounter one, please don't feed it or engage in any other activities that could prolong its suffering. In the unlikely event that you find a compound organism containing one or more human beings, please contact the park staff and you'll be entered in a raffle to receive a complimentary flesh pit t-shirt or hat. Have you or a loved one been combined with one or more whitetail bucks while visiting the pulsating vistas of the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park? All new from Anodyne, it's the Brain Case. Now your brain, and if you're lucky, spinal cord can exist in the new streamlined state-of-the-art fishbowl life support system. If you purchase the premium package, you could even get a vocoder to communicate and some of your sense organs back to deliver a sensory experience close to which of that you previously enjoyed. All for one low price of 99 99 99 99 your journey into the flesh pit will begin as you descend an elevator deep into the beast and arrive at the lower visitor center. This expansive multi-story shopping complex has everything. Restaurants, clothing stores, romantic depots, the whole nine yards. Some of the restaurants were accused of serving the meat from the walls of the cave, but it was denied by the park. People have tried the meat, though, and confirmed that it was too gamey to market to even the most adventurous of eaters. However, the arthropod monsters running around are reportedly delectable when steamed with a side of butter. I'm guessing they taste like somewhere between lobster and crab. Experience the majesty of nature from the inside on one of our many hikes. For a breath of fresh air, try visiting the northern bronchial forest. On the Swallowed Hole tour, you experience a Vorophile's dream in reverse and climb up an eight-story esophagus. Be careful, this one is marked for those who don't have a fear of being eaten alive. For the refined consumer, consider visiting the Intrapark Wellness Resort in the stomach, overlooking the beautiful gastric seas. This isn't just a family park, if you know what I mean. If you're looking for a romantic getaway, the amniotic fluid springs are the perfect place to put the spark back in any relationship. The fluid is an aphrodisiac, has healing properties, and guests sometimes report making life-lasting emotional connections in the pit. The springs range in dilution. The higher the dilution, the stronger the effects. If you are visiting a spa below the green line, please consult a physician beforehand. If you are visiting a spa below the yellow line, please consult a religious figure or sexual wellness counselor beforehand. The areas with lower concentration are open to all ages, but after a few people caught cases from the FBI, we decided to restrict the springs in the pit with the highest concentrations to 18 years of age or older. You may have come across this amniotic fluid before you even step foot in the park. This juice has led to an effective treatment for Alzheimer's, cancers, and many other life-threatening illnesses. Anodyne also provides it to companies to create consumer goods like Coke Heartthrob, the Feel Good McFlurry, and our proprietary aphrodisiac liqueur. So you're probably wondering why this place got shut down. Let me read the entire incidents report from July 4th, 2007 because I'm legally obligated to. 
Incident timeline. Start of relevant timeline. 10.29 a.m. July 4th. Unseasonably high rains force park administration to cancel a July 4th concert and fireworks display scheduled to take place on the surface park grounds. Many visitors who had already purchased tickets to the event become upset and a decision is made to extend the park hours until midnight for those who had purchased event tickets. 8 p.m. Normal closing time for National Park. A typical shift change of reduced night staff in the control room takes place. 9.16 p.m. Harvesting crews working in the west extremities of the organism set a new extraction record to meet a quota for bonuses in time for the holiday weekend. 9.30 p.m. Control room operators initiate a routine system self-test and discover a relay fault error resulting from increased electrical demand from mining equipment and tourist infrastructure. A control room operator logs the fault and notifies an on-duty engineer. 9.41 p.m. July 4th. Water drainage from surface rain into entry orifice begins to collect in the sand gullet. Drainage pumps are automatically activated by a sensor system but fail to initialize due to relay fault. An emergency backup pump running on a separate emergency circuit is automatically activated. 9.42 p.m. A critical alarm in the control room alerts operators that the emergency water pump has seized and is inoperative. Under lubrication of the pump's implier bushings resulted in corrosion due to the moist interior of the flesh pit environment. 9.48 p.m. Technicians arrive at the primary pump station to discover the sand gullet almost completely submerged. Water begins to pour over the dorsal respiratory ridge and into the bronchial bulbules. Control room operators divert power to hydraulic stint ramps to brace for expected choke response. 9.51 p.m. Technicians repair a relay fault as the control staff resets the park electrical grid. The grid is offline for 45 seconds. The automatic PA system does not notify guests as the system is scheduled to automatically shut down at the normal 8 p.m. closing time. The temporary lapse of lighting causes many guests to become panicked and return to the main gantry lift at the lower visitor center. 9.52 p.m. A choking action from the organism begins 31 seconds into the electrical reset. The main dorsal trunk violently flexes. Lack of power to the hydraulic arming rams causes irreparable damage to several sections of internal infrastructure. 9.53 p.m. As the electrical system finishes the reboot cycle, the dynamic hydraulic actuator supporting the lower visitor center overcorrect for stability, not accounting for the shift in the wall lining of the next seal cavity in which the visitor center facility is anchored. Two of the six structural supports are torn from their foundations, which causes the facility to list 20 degrees off vertical. The base joint of the vertical entry gantry is bent beyond its design limit angle. 9.54 p.m. The master alarm is tripped automatically. Surface facilities are notified as response teams are given the order to mobilize. 9.56 p.m. Park rangers are dispatched to rescue groups of visitors trapped in partially collapsed tunnels and trails. 10.03 p.m. Continued movement of the organism combined with rainwater causes one of the upper entry gantry supports to slip. An outbound elevator conducts an emergency stop stranding over two dozen and visitors. 10.05 p.m. Tremors registered as far away as the DFW Metroplex. 10.06 p.m. Soil liquefaction destabilizes surface facilities in and around the organism. Dilation anchors begin retracting to keep the entry orifice open. 10.12. A master failsafe is activated by the automatic park management system. 20,000 liters of acinetin compound are injected into the superorganism via a distributed network of relay stations located throughout its known internal anatomy. 10.12 p.m. Tremors and convulsions intensify as the entry gantry connection to the lower visitor center detaches completely. The lower visitor center begins to collapse downward into the nexial cavity. 10.12 p.m. Peristatic muscle action of the nexial cavity begins to exert substantial pressure on the outer structure of the lower visitor center facility. 10.15 p.m. The prime labioid junction just west of Septum Falls geobiological feature flexes into an open position, releasing a torrent of lastrogastric chyma into the dorsal trunk. It is likely that this was a reaction to the acinetin injection. 10 16 p.m. Peristatic spasms force the caustic chyma slurry through the nexial cavity and up the lower and upper moisture crops towards the surface orifice. 10.16 p.m. Many guests attempting to flee the stalled elevator near the entry orifice attempt climbing out the upper moisture crop but are ultimately unsuccessful due to the torrential rains causing the surface to become very slippery. Many end up falling back into the maw. 10.17 p.m. The chyma slurry erupts from the surface orifice in a geyser several hundred meters in height. Large pieces of undigested organic matter crush several vehicles and damage windows. 10.19 p.m. Following the several minute long ejecta event, a deep and incredibly loud roar erupts from the entry orifice as ground tremors intensify further. Large extremities begin surfacing through bedrock and soil approximately 30 to 120 kilometers from the entry orifice. 
10.25 p.m. The acrid smell of the gastric ejecta can be detected as far as Odessa, Texas. 10.26 p.m. Two park service vehicles and a tour vehicle containing park service employees and several guests attempt to ascend through the entry orifice tube. 10.27 p.m. Parastatic action crushes one or more of the tour vehicles and sucks the other two vehicles back into the nexial cavity and down into a digestive organ. These vehicles are presumed destroyed. 10.58 p.m. The Pentagon is given authorization from the White House to use nuclear force if necessary to prevent the organism from entering a non-dormant state. 11.02 p.m. The on-site operations director within the lower visitor center control room initiates a final fail-safe measure in the form of redacted contingency measure. 11.02. Master log event records successful spin-up of the redacted contingency measure. 11.05 p.m. Lower visitor center structural integrity is critically compromised resulting in total collapse. 11.05 p.m. Data connection with lower visitor center is severed. 11.13 p.m. Spasms and motor action of the superorganism begin to noticeably subside. Response teams begin to descend into the surface orifice to attempt rescue operations. 11.19 p.m. Response team encounters visitor group which had attempted to escape from stalled elevator. Most are dead. The remainder are mortally wounded and partially digested due to gastric ejecta. 11.42 p.m. Radio contact established with ranger vehicle trapped in oyster shame. Due to ventricle closure, no feasible rescue strategy can be developed before complete mastication occurs. 11.56 p.m. Response team confirms that redacted contingency measure and associated facility are still intact and operating. 11.58 p.m. Texas Governor Rick Perry formally declares a state of emergency for Gumption County. 12.22 a.m. July 5th. Response teams route data slash power umbilical to new base camp in redacted contingency measure facility. 12.35 a.m. Three interpit life forms are identified as having been ejected into the surface. Fifteen visitors are injured and seven are hunted by the interpit life forms during panicked evacuation of surface resort. 12.41 a.m. Park staff manage to kill the three large life forms. 1.02 a.m. National Guard helicopters begin delivering supplies and personnel to aid in site containment. 1.58 a.m. Field hospital is constructed to care for wounded staff and visitors. 2.37 a.m. Initial damage surveys report catastrophic destruction of internal park infrastructure. It geobi biology has dramatically changed in hazard level. 3 a.m. Emergency teleconference of anodyne executive leadership. National Parks Director and Security of the Interior are present. 3.12 a.m. Executive decision is made to initiate FEMA response and assemble a task force for containing superorganism. 4 a.m. Media helicopters and vehicles begin to report on the scope of the disaster. 4.39 a.m. Base camp technicians begin to spin down redacted contingency measure. Large fracture due to inertial stress have appeared on mineral components. Engineers advise against reinitializing redacted contingency measure until mineral opponents can be replaced or repaired. 6.08 a.m. Ground personnel begin assembling a pump system to inject industrial sedative into the superorganism. Transport trucks containing industrial sedative arrive. 9.45 a.m. Emergency teleconference of anodyne shareholders. 11.20 a.m. Several injured visitors inexplicably leave field hospital and begin walking towards the open pit orifice. Approximately 38 individuals are able to crawl back into the orifice over the course of eight hours. None are recovered. 3.51 p.m. Radio transmission from trapped ranger vehicle ceases. Many speculate that other small groups of visitors and staff are still trapped. End of relevant timeline. This incident is responsible for over 750 fatalities, 1,800 major injuries, and 18,000 people sought medical and psychological treatment for symptoms including chest pains, shortness of breath, nausea, birth defects, hallucinations, depression, anxiety, internal bleeding, sore throat, and headaches as a result of the gastric ejecta that was released into the atmosphere. The Investigators have concluded that this disaster was caused by Anodyne's negligent practices and because this was bound to happen with something that's literally a testament to man's hubris built inside of a giant monster. But it totally wasn't their fault at all because stop asking questions and go home. The most fascinating of the many conspiracy theories that surround the mystery flesh pit national park is the legend of the marrow folk. The marrow folk are thought to be a humanoid species that evolved to live in the pit. Some marrow folk conspiracy theorists believe they evolved from humans who began living in the superorganism millions of years ago. Reported sightings of these people are thought to be gas bowels being mistaken for the flesh Bigfoot. By name alone, the marrow folk are likely to make their homes in the holes of the megafauna's bone marrow. If they look similar enough to be mistaken for a gas bowel, they're likely somewhat to resemble them, but larger and more humanoid in shape. I would suspect that they would survive either by harvesting meat and biological tissue from the marrow and the walls, hunting interpit life forms and tourists, 
or a little of each and a little cannibalism here and there to keep things interesting. The mystery flesh pit truly is a dark, moist, slippery, undiscovered frontier. Even since the last video, our team has more hypotheses about the elusive biological marvels that make their home in the pit. The Venus Shamble most likely uses its vascular extensions both to feed off of nutrients and fluids from the anatomy of the pit, and also for locomotion. I'd guess that many a tourist have woken up in a twisted weave of veins slowly sapping their moisture. Heike kind of looks like a Dumbo octopus being swallowed by a sea cucumber with such force that it crapped out all of its veins through its skin. This is the lesser copepod. It's like the abyssal copepod, but apparently lesser. I reject that notion. He's not the lesser copepod. We're gonna call him the short king copepod. Let's talk about the ballast sirens. My theory is that they're located in the amniotic ballast. When people are under the extreme aphrodisiac effects of the strongest springs, chances are they will be in a hypersensual and very suggestible state, and they will want to stick their bits in literally anything that has a slot that it fits with. The ballast siren will attempt to attract these horned up inebriated individuals like a siren to put their bits in one of the holes, and then the suction grabs them and they suck all of the internal organs out of the naughty hole. Or maybe they don't do that, who knows? I just made all that up from context from its name and anatomy. You got a better idea? Leave it in the comments. The gastric bristle worm is named after a regular bristle worm, which is a common nautical animal that often acts as a decomposer. The gastric bristle worm likely explores the digestive system like an ocean and helps the megafauna digest organic material. If you found yourself unlucky enough to be being digested by the pit, just know that this thing will be swimming in and out of your melting skin while it happens. Moving on, the bone mite is a large parasitic mite that feeds off the bone bone marrow and blood of the superorganism. If these mites function like I think they do, then I suspect very soon tourists will be found with no bones or blood and their skin covered in bone mite bites. My theory about the little wiggly abomination that looks like an upside down Christmas tree called the gangliotoad is that it's basically a nematode, or a parasitic roundworm, except it's on the scale of the gargantuan creature that is the superorganism and thus could probably slurp all your blood out so hard that your skin and organs crumple up like a drained Capri Sun. The shrieking cloistropod looks like a cronin themed quadruple ended vibrator that operates solely on biological pulsation. It looks like it might root itself into the walls of the flesh and then shriek, I guess? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what this one does. I'm moving on. The stinging triocanth kind of looks like a giant wiggly wasp with wiggly deer horns. I'm guessing it acts like a giant wiggly wasp too and stings the crap out of whatever it sees until it's no longer alive. Remember folks, everything in the pit actively wants to end your existence. So actually like you would if you were in the wild in Australia. Well, maybe not that extreme, but you know, the same idea. There's reports of an interpit life form capable of creating a hallucinogenic venom in glands behind its eyes and spraying it at those who disturb it as a defense mechanism. I will call this creature an expectorate. It has two large, seemingly bioluminescent eyes it uses to see in the inky darkness of the guts, and four appendages which it uses to drag itself through the folds of the flesh scape. It's often camouflaged in the crevices of the pit anatomy, and uncautious tourists have been sprayed with large amounts of venom that can cause radical perspective shifting and perception of new insights, euphoria, immersive experiences, disassociation and non-responsiveness, sensual enhancement, dysphoria, fear, terror, or panic. Testing of this venom reveals it to be a chemical very similar to 5-MeO-DMT, a powerful psychedelic produced in the venom glands of the Bufo alivaris toad that lives across the southern United States. For this reason, I have deduced that the expectorate is a Bufo alivaris that made its home out of the pit, and then evolved like the amorphous shame. Nah, I made this guy up completely, he's not a part of the MFP, but I had you though, right? The Gift Garden is yet another example of how the mystery flesh pit is capable of feats that boggle the entire scientific community. Deep in the superorganism is an organ composed of large bronchioles containing tens of thousands of what were soon deemed gift sacs. These sacs receive nutrients from arteries, but this nutrient-rich slurry also contain construction materials such as plastic, metals, wood, and silicate. The gift gardens would use these materials to grow objects that were familiar to a guest. Examples include childhood toys, photos of loved ones, and old appliances. Closer inspection of these items revealed them to be not perfect copies, but instead occasionally functional but often convincing recreations of these objects. Once the gift had gestated enough, the sack would turn translucent, signifying that the guest's gift is ready for collection and will be available to them for a nominal fee after harvesting. Scientists have absolutely no idea how this organ works, but some theorize it's a process involving the pit's neural tissue receiving brain waves from the humans inside of it. While the idea of the pit having telepathy is unsettling, there's no reason to think it would use this for predatory purposes. Park is closed, get the fuck out. Oh. <laughs> 
a subterranean superorganism slash ecosystem that inspires a primal terror even more severe than my AirPods falling out when I'm using the urinal. While the pit remains as fleshy as ever, recent scientific findings in the form of an MFP Tumblr Q&A make it slightly less mysterious. Although, some just raise more questions than answers, so I just, I just lied to you. We know a decent bit about the flesh pit at this point, but what actually the f*** is it? Geo and Venterio biologists have reached an understanding that the superorganism displays pentadecagonal symmetry. Although this isn't your grandma's mind-bending leviathan 15-legged starfish monster, its biology is not nearly as simple on the vertical axis as it is on the horizontal. With this discovery, one of the most pressing questions about the superorganism has finally been answered. That being, how many holes does it have, where are they, and what can we use them for? From the most recent Q&A, is the main entry orifice the only one the mystery flesh pit possesses? If not, were the other ones also used by Anodyne for resource exploitation? This isn't the first time I've stumbled across orifice exploitation on the internet and was pleasantly surprised. Anyway, in addition to the main entry orifice, an additional 14 orifices were eventually discovered, bringing the total number to 15. These other 14 orifices are arranged in a loose circle around what is assumed to be the true center of the organism, and they were plugged up by the Bureau of Land Management because they made up an excuse or something to cover the fact that they're into that sh**. You have a weird f sh dude, just own it, it's not a big deal. There were plans for Anodyne to make another one of these holes gape to unnatural proportions to create a second gate for the park, but the 2007 tragedy happened before that could take place. I had so many clips that I want to, but can't not use to portray the phrase gaping hole. <laughs> we know a lot about the anatomy of this creature, but what about its most important organ? Unfortunately, we don't yet know what its cock looks like, so I'll just have to explain you the brain. Just like you, the superorganism does not have a traditional brain. Rather, the Permian superorganism contains what geobiologists term a distributed heuristic hierarchical nervous system. From the text, this central ring connects five enormous miles wide concentrated brain regions which are theorized to comprise a central nervous system system used by the superorganism to simultaneously think as well as manage the many hundreds of miles of the mystery flesh pit's anatomy. The management system is further divided into hundreds of superganglia, managed by each pentalobe, broadly categorized into alpha, beta, and gamma variants. Alpha ganglia manage thousands of local nerve clusters responsible for executive functions such as motor control, digestive management, lymph production, vascular management, as well as dozens of other functions. Gamma ganglia are almost the reverse counterpart to the alpha ganglia. Gamma ganglia manage the many thousands of nerves and sensory receptors throughout the mystery flesh pit, translating this enormous amount of info into usable data for the central pentalobal nervous system. Unique are the many beta ganglia clusters which seem to fill in a sort of local memory function which has no direct analog in mainstream biology. These beta ganglia clusters exhibit phenomenal storage capacity for stimuli response memory and were often harvested for their biotechnological applications before the 2007 tragedy. In addition to this weird collection of pseudo brains, on an expedition researchers discovered an organ at a far off extremity that was analogous to an eye. It was around 1.2 kilometers or 0.7 miles in diameter with a retinal region much larger than a football field and a highly evolved lens. These organs are attracted into an internal carapace to protect from the rock that it is surrounded by. I'm putting a bounty on this massive eye. One million flesh coins to whoever can bring it to me still preserved and transplantable. I'm working on an art project. <laughs> Told ya, mystery flesh pit is the best hunting and fishing spot on earth. Great date spot too. So good that if it weren't for the spermicidal effects of the amniotic springs, the guy who writes my awful jokes would be taking care of a kid right now. It's no secret that regular old earth fauna that falls or gets dragged kicking and screaming and praying into the pit can get amalgamated into combination flesh monsters, but have you ever wondered how big the largest compound organism to grace the flesh scape was? Venteriologists theorized that once, hundreds of years ago, a herd of longhorn cattle over a thousand strong were consumed by the pit. These cattle underwent a mass amalgamation, but were able to survive for an extended period of time due to the size of the organism, and that it could consume its own mass to extend its miserable existence. The pit slowly grew a flesh sack around the compound megacow, which scientists think were for the purpose of digesting it. The horns of this compound megacow consistently gore a hole into this sac, and to this day, the tear in the tissue lining combined with the rhythmic suffering of the megacow is known as the Peking Druid Geobiological Formation. I find it unfair that when I have a gaping wound constantly leaking fluids, people vomit and pass out, but when the flesh pit does it, it's a tourist attraction. That's double standard. Abyssal copepod. Those weird fingers are probably useful for lots of things that I can never unimagined. Pass. I need therapy, but you need therapy more because you clicked on this for enjoyment. <laughs> 
I cannot believe I have to have this conversation with all of you again. Telling someone to play Smash or Pass with the mystery flesh pit fauna is not only inappropriate, but it's also disgustingly horrible and depraved to a point beyond recovery. And I am so honored that all of you thought of me to be your dark guide in this defiance to God. So let's get into it. Lesser Copapod. I think this is just like the Abyssal Copapod, except it's a submissive. Pass. Any hole with an exoskeleton on the outside sounds like sticking it in an antique pencil sharpener. Bone Mite. I have a thing about bugs in my bed, especially ones that want to suck my bones out and leave me a skin puddle. Pass. Just like the bone thieves can't get it up. Macrobacteria. I'm pretty sure that anything organic that goes in there gets dissolved and digested. Not a huge vor guy. Although, some theorize that multicellular life was created when one cell ate another and didn't absorb it. So perhaps my dick could become the powerhouse of this new amalgamation cell. Smash, but for science. Ganglio toad. Now, there are a lot of things you could do with this weird flesh tube feather duster, but all of them feel kind of like torture methods. That's some uncanny valley BDSM type shit. Smash. Amorphous shame. This thing is just one long slippery tube. Realistically, I bet I could use this creature as a condom to fuck something else. Is that technically a three-way? Smash. Venus shamble. You could kind of stick it in the front. Or if you're a girl and like incredibly promiscuous, you could attempt to insert the entire thing like that one porn video where that girl sticks an entire bald man's head up her vagina. You ever see that one? Pass. Greater ballast siren and lesser ballast siren. Okay, seeing as how you're already in in the amniotic springs, there's likely not a single thing any conscious being wouldn't bone when in that liquid crap. Smash, but not of my own choice. Shrieking Cloistropod. Okay, so this thing could both be used as a fleshlight and a dildo, but it's a little too hairy for my tastes. No shade if that's your thing, and like, it's not gonna stop me if I'm really into someone, but this thing is basically just four sex toys taped together, so pass. Though aren't we all just like four sex toys taped together? Stinging Triocanth. These things kind of remind me of giant fleshy wasps. Last time I had a regular wasp near my dingle, it ended incredibly poorly. Pass. The pit itself. Even if I wanted to say smash, which I don't, I don't logistically see any feasible way to get this done. Despite the fact that my dick is obviously Lovecraftian in scale, but please don't check, there's no situation in which this just wouldn't be like a hot dog in a hallway. Straight up though, it's kinda like screwing a famous person. Even if they aren't hot, it's a huge flex. Smash. Hopefully it can lead to some good networking opportunities. Gas bowel. Could you imagine the suction potential this small, strange, slimy creature holds? Smash. Expectorate. Now, I'm not sure if doing the sextorate to the expectorate would give you the special DMT venom, but there's only one way to find out. Smash. Compound organism. It really depends on the compound organism in this case, because if I'm dealing with country bears, Cronenberg Jamboree, or the circus clown Chymus, the answer is going to be different than if some raging incel throws a bunch of e-girls into the pit. Gastric bristle worm. I'm already in a committed relationship with the parasitic worms that I already have, so pass. Anodyne sensory organ brain case. Imagine your entire existence was just a brain and a tongue, and then one day you felt and tasted that someone was rubbing their dick on it. I have no mouth and I must come. Pass. Marrow folk. So it's kind of like a human, but more slimy and kind of like that weird sticky goblin creature from The Descent. Is there a third option that depends on how many drinks I've had? Because is my video, and now there is, and that's the one that I pick. Want to know the most fucked up part of all of this? I'm actually starting to have fun making these videos, but I will never admit it to you. So why the hell are you doing this, you evil pervert? But also, please come back for the next time I play Would I Stick My Dick In It? Also, please like, subscribe, smack bell, and watch more of my content, because if you don't, I got amniotic syphilis for no reason, and the pills to get rid of it are expensive, so I'm gonna need the iron. <laughs>